Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I will not pretend, pretend that we have not done this before. Uh, Ted was on our CBS morning uh, yesterday. Um, and he was, we just taped a program for my show tonight on PBS. Uh, so we ha we're here to talk about many things, including uh, a book that's getting lots of attention, being talked about on the Senate floor, called Lights Out. Uh, if I had a copy here, I would show it to you. Uh, but we'll talk about that. We also want to talk about a remarkable life in journalism. Nightline was a, ah, oh, thank you so much. Um, I, it, I would like to introduce my youngest daughter, Tara. <laughs> Hello, how are you? <laughs> um, in fact, uh, listen, this is the dedication of the book. I had so much fun reading this on the show today. It is to, to our grandchildren, Jake and Dylan, Aiden, Alice, and Annabelle, Cole and Grace Ann. Here's hoping that Opie got it wrong. Here's Opie. That's Opie. <laughs> uh, but also, as Nightline won all those awards, and for anybody uh, who has a measly two Peabody to know that he's sitting here with eight and all those other awards, and all those awards which were deserved because Nightline uh, had a special place in American journalism. You knew that you were going to see uh, by an intelligent reporter a rigorous examination of people about their responsibilities in government or for other activities. Uh, and that was what Nightwatch was, and, and that was that way because of what Ted was, a great reporter with experience and knowledge uh, and a remarkable talent uh, to ask questions and ask the right question. Uh, all of us remember uh, a series of, of interviews that he did in Israel uh, and the kinds of, of conversations he had trying to get at what separated the Palestinians and the Israelis. So we'll talk about all of that, but I want to begin with the book. We also will talk about him today and what he's doing other than writing books. Um, why did you write this book? I, I wrote it because important people from the president on down were making provocative comments about the danger of a cyber attack against American infrastructure, particularly against the American power grid. The president did it not once but twice in his State of the Union address, and the next day when the newspapers and the television networks covered the story of the address, there was no mention. The Secretary of Defense at the time, Leon Panetta, talked about the danger of a cyber Pearl Harbor. There is no more loaded term, I think, in, in modern American history than Pearl Harbor. The notion that a cyber attack could produce something even remotely like Pearl Harbor struck me as an extraordinary statement for a Secretary of, uh, of Defense to make. Got almost no coverage. Only a week ago, uh, Admiral Mike Rogers, who is the director of the NSA, told a Wall Street Journal conference that it was inevitable, his word, inevitable that a cyber attack on our infrastructure would take place. Nobody's paying any attention. And uh, I decided to, to make some preliminary phone calls to see what, if anything, since so many senior members of the government were warning of the danger of this, what preparations, what plans was the federal government making in the event that this were to happen for the safeguarding of the American civilian public? And I, I began with the assumption that the answer would be not much. That was an exaggerated expectation. <laughs> they have done essentially nothing. When I say nothing, I mean FEMA and the Department of Homeland Security has made uh, extensive plans to deal with the aftermath of a hurricane, the aftermath of a flood, the aftermath uh, of a tornado, the aftermath even of an earthquake. But a cyber attack, Charlie, would be something totally different. And how would it be launched, and what would be the impact? Well, the launching is as simple as the, as the pressing of a key on a, on a laptop. Both the Chinese and the Russians, I've been told by 
uh, not just Keith Alexander, who was the director of the NSA before Admiral Rogers, but by his chief scientist. Uh, the Chinese and the Russians have already buried what we can call cyber landmines in our, in our power grid. They would have no trouble at all. It would be as simple as pressing a key and they could bring down all or part of the grid. What we're talking about here is something that would affect tens of millions, if not more than 100 million Americans, for a period that could last as long as a year or more. And, and one of the difficulties is you don't know where the attack is coming from. That's, that's one of the key dis, uh, distinctions between all the dangers that you and I and people of our generation have been worrying about for 50 years. Um, the one thing we knew when we worried about the danger of a nuclear attack was where it would come from. First of all, we knew that there were only a handful of countries that had nuclear weapons. Secondly, if a nuclear weapon was launched uh, by missile against the United States, even though the, the warning time would be very short, uh, a president would have essentially a little bit less than half an hour to make a decision as to how to respond and whether to respond immediately. At least he would know where the attack originated. A cyber attack, think only of how long it took the FBI to trace the attack that North Korea launched against Sony Pictures. It was months before they could say with certainty that the attack came from North Korea. If an attack comes and knocks out our power grid, and if tens of millions of Americans are left without electricity, it's going to have a disastrous impact. But if someone walks into the Oval Office and says, Mr. President, um, we can't tell you for sure. We think with 57% certainty that the attack was launched in Ukraine. And the president says, wait a second, 57% certainty. How do you expect me to respond? Against whom should I launch what? On the basis of 57% certainty? How long before you have 100% certainty? Maybe never. I don't want to ramble on too long, Charlie, but the great danger of the internet is that it was never designed to be defended. It was never designed to be a closed system. It was designed to be as open as anything could possibly be. I assume that anything that anybody could do to our grid, we could do worse to their grid. I think that's a fair assumption. And their grid is not as sophisticated as our grid. Right. And so surviving the aftermath, which is your third subtitle, what does that mean? Well, what it means is I, I just want you to, to speculate for a few minutes. Uh, you folks here in Manhattan, those of you who lived in the lower half of Manhattan, during Superstorm Sandy, will remember what it was like to be totally without electric power for a period of a few days. Imagine what it would be like if the affected area covered several states, tens of millions of people, and if the impact lasted not a few days, but weeks, months, many months, there has to be some kind of a plan. But when I, when I spoke to, I interviewed every former Secretary of Homeland Security. They all conceded flat out, there is no plan. I spoke to Jay Johnson, who is the current Secretary of Homeland Security. His response was a little more ambiguous. I asked him whether there was a plan. He, he sort of gestured up to a bunch of white folders on the, on the shelf of his office and said, I'm sure, I'm sure there's a plan up there somewhere. And, and my question to him was, doesn't it make sense that you would tell the American public about the plan while you still have access to all forms of communication? Why wait until after the grid is out? How are you going to convey the plan? And what are people going to do in the midst of all that chaos to implement the camp? Uh, the plan. 
Bottom line, there is no plan. What do you hope this book achieves? Uh, two things. First of all, I think we're dealing here with one of, those, one of those rare subjects on which there ought not to be any partisan difference. This is not something, Charlie, that should separate liberals and conservatives, Republicans from Democrats. Um, if the United States is attacked in that fashion, it amounts to an act of war. And it is something that we all need to cooperate on before the fact. Once it happens, the level of, of chaos, I believe, is going to be so great that it will be very, very difficult to implement any kind of plan. I would like to see it become an issue in the subjects discussed during this presidential campaign. That may not work out uh, so far. And who, who treats the idea of preparing for it with the appropriate urgency and has a plan well, I mean, the, uh, I don't want to suggest that the, that the Mormon church is particularly concerned about an attack uh, on the power grid. But Mormons for 200 years uh, have, have been pushed from pillar to post, and they have learned to prepare for emergencies. And I spent three chapters in the book talking about how the Mormon church has done that, what some of their preparations are, and I think many of us can learn from what they have done. Uh, no subject that you covered, I assume, more intently after uh, Nightline became uh, such a prominent part of our nightly life, uh, having to do first with the hostages, and then secondly, with Israeli-Palestinian issues. Right. Where do you think that debate, that difference, that conflict, that possibility of uh, increased hostilities, and maybe a third intifada stands? Uh, I think about as, as dangerous a situation as you and I have ever, ex ever experienced in our lifetime. Uh, I see neither the inclination nor the outlines of a plan that could be implemented. Uh, I see U.S. influence over both parties diminished. There was a time, I believe, when what the United States proposed could have an impact. Um, I don't see a whole lot of that anymore. I'm, I'm terribly pessimistic. You're pessimistic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is, why do we have less, possib less power to influence in, in the events? What's happened to America and its relationship there? Well, I, th I think part of what has happened is that we have, we have squandered, and, and if you'll permit me, it, it, it relates actually to the subject of how we respond to an impending crisis. Tom Ridge, who was the first Secretary of Homeland Security, said to me, we, are, we as a people, we Americans, are not very good at preemptive action. Right. We are a reactive people. And if you look at how we reacted to the events of 9-11 in 2001, I cannot imagine any adversary or enemy of the United States having believed at the time, in the days leading up to 9-11, that the consequences of the attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and, and the crash plane in Pennsylvania, that the consequences of that would be so devastating to the United States. Think about it. We have spent $3 trillion. We have lost somewhere in the neighborhood now of six or 7,000 young men and women, tens of thousands of others, terribly injured. Um, you mean in the wars we've fought since? I mean in the wars we have fought and are still fighting and if you take a look, I mean I, I must confess I am not a, a huge fan of Donald Trump as a presidential candidate. That will come as an enormous shock I know to you. Uh, what is it that troubles you most about Mr. Trump? <laughs> Winston Churchill once said, America eventually, or the Americans eventually, 
always end up doing the right thing but not until after they have exhausted every other possibility. <laughs> I think we are in the process right now of exhausting every other possibility. Uh, the, the, the great Baltimore journalist, H.L. Mencken, yeah. once said, nobody ever went broke underestimating the good taste of the American public. I'll leave it at that. All right. Well, speaking of that, what do you think of uh, Secretary Clinton as a presidential candidate? Well, I mean, she is clearly experienced. She is clearly a, a, a woman who uh, is coming into her own as a presidential candidate. Um, she leaves a lot of people. She leaves a lot of people cold. But right now, you know, you can't beat something with nothing. Uh, and if you look at what the Republicans are doing to one another, uh, you have to wonder who will be left standing and what kind of condition they will be in at the time that it happens. Look, our election campaigns, to state the obvious, are about a year too, too long. long. Right. Right? But in your place of birth, it's what, about six weeks? About six weeks. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the Canadians just had an election. What was it, a 10, 11, 12-week yeah. campaign? And they were complaining about the fact that it and, was... And had a surprise it, result. And had a surprise result. They're complaining about the fact that it was too long. We have, we have and turned... And too costly. And that. We have turned our, our political process into a fiasco. I mean, we really have. Uh, some think that foreign policy will be a larger part of the debate this year than it has been in previous years. We all remember that when Bill Clinton ran, you know, their mantra was, it's the economy, stupid. Right. Um, but foreign policy, because of ISIS, uh, because of uh, Syria, has become of increasing concern. You know, how do you think the president has handled Syria? And what do you think his options are now? Look, and is it possible that he's going to end up more engaged than he ever wanted to be? Well, clearly, he's already more engaged than he ever wanted to be. Um, I don't think, I mean, I think one of the mistakes we make is that we try to look at these, at these different crisis areas in isolation when in fact they, they are not isolated from one another. Donald Trump has said something uh, for which he was mocked and ridiculed, but I must say I, I kind of agree I I with him. Yeah. He said, uh, look, the world might be better off today if Gaddafi was still in power in Libya and if Saddam Hussein was still in power in Iraq. And everyone was shocked. What a terrible thing to say. A couple of nasty people like, like Gaddafi in Libya and Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Not famous for their human rights policies. Not famous for their human rights policies. But A, the fact of the matter is the United States has never made its alliances based upon the human rights policies of the countries that it feels it needs to associate with. When we associated with Korea, South Korea, in the, in the 1950s, I think it was Park Chung-hee who was, who was president of South Korea. Human rights? There were no human rights in South Korea in those days. When Sukarno was in power in Indonesia, Indonesia and launched a campaign against the communists. Communists meant anyone who opposed Sukarno. Half a million people were killed in Indonesia in those days. But the United States felt that Sukarno was a solid anti-communist and a good ally to have in that part of the world. And, I, you know, and, and that, the first requirement for being a friend of America was to be anti-communist. Was to be anti-communist. The fact of the matter is, when it suited our purposes, when Iran and Iraq were at war in the 1980s, 800,000 young Iranians and Iraqis were killed in that war. Whom did we support, the United States? Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein, because we considered the danger of a, a rising Iran to be far greater than the danger of a dictator in Iraq. And the fact of the matter is what we have achieved with our war in Iran is not just a rising Iran, but an Iran that has... The war in Iraq. The war in Iraq, right. yes. Uh, is, is that Iran has become... I think arguably more influential in Iraq today than we are. 
clearly influential in Syria, clearly influential in Lebanon. Um, and as we look at the... Influential in Yemen? At the after, well, there too. And as we look at the aftermath of, of what has happened following our war, our long, long, costly war in Iraq, and following our sort of uh, half-baked intervention in Libya and the overthrow of Gaddafi. Libya today is a non-functioning state. The weapons that were in Libya are now in the hands of ISIS. And, and a rising uh, ISIS presence. And a rising ISIS presence there too. So, um, you know, when, when Trump says he's not at all sure that the world is better off now that we are rid of Saddam and rid of Gaddafi, he's not entirely wrong. But so what does the president do now? Um, ISIS uh, is perceived as stronger than al-Qaeda ever was. ISIS is perceived as having used social media to attract new people and constant flow of new people to their ranks. Uh, ISIS is perceived you know, as having influence beyond uh, the, the so-called caliphate, mm -hmm. the new Islamic State. What does a president do? Does he join with Russia? Does he join with Iran? Uh, does he allow Assad to stay in power uh, and not take him on, if that is still an option? Yes, yes, uh, and yes. Yes, okay. Yes, on all of those things. He, uh, look, uh, Churchill once said about Stalin, you know, I would make an alliance with the devil if that's what was needed to defeat Nazism, right? And Stalin was the devil. And Stalin was the devil. And Stalin was a man, I mean, you know, if you raise the term human rights in the context of the Soviet Union during World War II, what a joke, what a joke. And yet it was important to make that alliance in order to defeat the, the, the growing... Okay, but so let's make this, I mean, being in the White House, as the president has <clears throat> often said, the only tough problems come up to that level. Everything Absolutely. is easy. Absolutely. They sandal before it and, gets there. And, and your friend and mine, Henry Kissinger, once said, Never go into the president and just tell him, Mr. President, we have a problem. If you, the, the president knows he's got he's nothing got problem. but problems. Yes. When you go into the Oval Office and you see the president, you'd better have a solution. It may not be the one he accepts, but you'd better have some kind of a solution. Okay, so let's talk about options. Should <clears throat> an option of the president be try to figure out, and they're doing this. I mean, they clearly are having conversations about this. Uh, should the president be trying to say to Vladimir Putin, Let's find a way to cooperate on this. I know you want to keep Assad in power, and we want him eventually out of power. Um, but you have come in to support him. I have allies, the president says, you know, in the Gulf states. They want him out now as a condition to doing more. Uh, that's not quite as much severe as it was, and we are not quite demanding it as much as we were. But should the president entertain the idea of somehow uh, working with Russia to defeat ISIS, yes. as long as Assad remains in power temporarily and Russia is a part of any plan to transition him out. Look, I think, first of all, there is an assumption that Putin is an unabashed admirer of Bashar al-Assad. Not true. He is not. Of course. As is. you well know. Right. I mean, you spoke to Putin for what? An hour and 40 no, minutes? No, three hours. Three hours. Yeah. Uh, well, part of it was dinner, but... <laughs> Oh, well. <laughs> no. No, we did an hour for I don't mean to joke about it. We did an hour and 40 minutes of conversation, which was way longer than any I've ever had with any. You know, when, the, when you go down to the White House, you know how long they allow you? 20 minutes. Yeah, exactly. You know? No, but he, he, he's very fond of you. He, he likes you. <laughs> <laughs> well, he likes somebody that took him seriously. He likes somebody that asked hard questions. And he liked someone that he said listened to him and, he and gave someone, him a chance to talk. And he, exactly. He liked someone who was polite yeah. and gives him the opportunity to, to talk. To and talk. if you do that, he's prepared to answer tough questions. Yep, indeed he is. You know, when you, I said you put people in prison uh, if they oppose you. You put journalists in prison if, and you kill them. You know, and you, know, you, you were corrupt and absolute power corrupt, all of that. You know, and, and he would then make an explanation uh, obviously, some of it was not true, but nevertheless, I mean, the point is, 
the point is, no, it's not, I mean, he defends himself, but I mean, sure. you know, I, if you think that Vladimir Putin is the first politician I've ever talked to who lied to me, I assure you that's not the case. Um, and, and whether they are Democrats or not Democrats, and small d. Um, but should we, in, in a new world order that your friend and mine, Henry Kissinger, writes about, look to Russia and say, ISIS is that big a problem. Let's get beyond Assad and get rid of ISIS because we have enough power to do that. You're the president. Putin is clearly more concerned and has reason to be more concerned about ISIS and the rising Islamic caliphate right. than we are. Right. So we have common interests. Right. When nations have common interests, it serves their purpose to collaborate. Putin is, is not committed, I believe, to keeping Assad in power. I don't believe that either. Not. So eventually down the road, we may be able to come to a, a common understanding as to, as to how... Okay, but, but then there's another point to this. First of all, I mean, clearly this Assad is doing a, a lot of inhumane things yes. uh, in terms of barrel bombs. And the people who've been killed the most are innocent Syrians. Right. They are not terrorists, the people who've suffered the most in this conflict. Um, should we, should we, can we, do we have the power to say, if you don't stop using barrel bombs, and, you know, there will be consequences? No. I mean, where can the United States now say uh, to anybody, if you do this, we're going to do that? You know? We're going to create a no-fly zone. If you come into the no-fly zone, we're going to shoot you down. And or would, we're going to shoot your planes down before they get off the tarmac. And, and what, would be the, what would be the ultimate sure. benefit right. of that? Um, you know, are we going to find ourselves in a few months in a position where we are collaborating with the Russians right. and the Iranians? Right. Yeah. We are. We are. Simply because we don't have an alternative. We're not going to send 50,000 troops to Syria, and if we did, it would be a disaster. Do I believe that the president is right, that, that, Asa, I mean, that, uh, that Putin is going to end up in a, in a swamp in Syria? I actually, I, I respect Putin's intelligence. I think, I think Putin is going to be smart enough to tip the balance back in Assad's favor in Syria. Yeah. And then he may be in a position to bargain. Then he will be in a position to bargain, and, and we'll be in a position where we need to take him seriously. What should be done to better the relationship between the United States and Israel? And what did you think of the Prime Minister of Israel coming here and going before Congress and making a case against the president for one of his positions and the, the, the Iranian nuclear deal. What do you think of Benjamin Netanyahu trying to influence America in that way? I thought it was inappropriate. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And so where is the state of the relationship today? It's whose responsibility is it to make it better? The, the state of the relationship is poor but the nature of the relationship is still solid. And we're uh, giving a lot of support to them militarily. We have no stronger, more reliable, or better ally in the Middle East than Israel. Israel has no stronger, better, or reliable ally in the world than the United States. When all is said and done, whether Barack Obama and, and Bibi Netanyahu like each other or can't stand each other is beside the point. Exactly. Yeah. Um, oh, but <clears throat> do you worry about Israel, for example? Uh, and you've been so many shows there, and I remember there was a show in which you had like a barrier. You remember that? Oh, I'll never, never, never forget it. Yes. Uh, what, what happened on that occasion, just to sort of wander through the corridors of time here, we had, we set up the first town meeting uh, that had ever been held with the Palestinians and the Israelis, Palestinian leaders and Israeli leaders. And the nature of the time difference between the United States and Israel was such that we were doing the program at about 6.30 in the morning, which I guess was 11.30 at night here. At 9 o'clock the evening before in Israel, the Palestinians inform us that the only way they will agree to appear on the stage with the Israeli guests, yeah. is if we unroll a, a coil 
of razor wire down the center of the stage, yeah. indicating that there is no connection between these two sides. And we said, absolutely not. Uh, I, I believe my old friend Rick Kaplan, who was the executive producer of Nightline at that time, is, is here. He spent most of that night sweating this thing out. Then they wanted booths. They were going to be in booths, and the Israelis would be in booths, thereby conveying the visual image of people who were on the same stage but not connected to each other in any way. We finally ended up with a little 18-inch wall. Yeah. that ran down the center of the stage and I straddled the wall and began the program by saying I'll spend half the program on one side, half the program yeah. on the other side. And it actually was one of the, one of the more memorable programs we had ever done. And what's interesting is most of the issues that you grapple with then are still part of us. The issue that was not so much then is the idea of demographics. Yeah. You know? And the idea of what wasn't expressed then of Israel as a Jewish state, something that Benjamin Netanyahu began to articulate maybe three or four years ago, right? Yeah. yeah. So my, I mean, the question is, is, is there a risk that at some point we will no longer have the possibility of creating a two-state solution and everything becomes then much more problematical for everybody? I think we're very close to that situation right now, Charlie. I think we're, we are at a point where both sides at least are saying, whether they mean it in their heart of hearts, that the time for a two-state solution has come and gone. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't honestly see a viable alternative to that. Uh, I, I'm just not smart enough to, to imagine what that would be. I think they have to go for a two-state solution. But sometimes people are only willing to do what they say they're not willing to do when the, when the alternative becomes so horrendous and so drastic that they are forced to the conclusion that they have to do what they said. Where are the Israelis at fault and where are the Palestinians at fault? Oh, don't make me go down there. <laughs> it's a, it's a, uh, I won't do that. I'll give you a pass on that. Um, so I want to come back to you as well, but let me I want to continue around the world. So uh, ISIS and only possibility there. Let me, is let me if I may, because it, uh, it's, it's not only relevant, but it, it may be the most dangerous aspect of this. what I was writing about in this book. Right. <clears throat> China, which has the capability of launching a cyber attack against our power grid at any time, probably won't do it because we have so many thousands of interlocking interests with them. The same thing, even though there are tensions between us and the Russians these days, the same thing is true of the Russians. To a degree, but less so true of the Iranians, far less true of the North Koreans, who may also have the capability of doing this, but to come back to what you were just getting into, the real danger is that a group like ISIS, which after all has acquired through its oil revenues and through kidnappings and a variety of bank a holdups, treasure chest. has a treasure chest of somewhere in the neighborhood of $2 billion. Mm -hmm. With $2 billion, you can buy a lot of expertise. There are a lot of internet experts out there. Mm -hmm. And you can bribe people in Pakistan. And you can bribe people in all parts of the world. Well, they have so many of them. Uh, but what I'm saying is, whereas the Chinese and the Russians and the Iranians and even the North Koreans may have reasons why they don't want to engage the United States in an all-out war, ISIS would like nothing better than to inflict the greatest possible damage that it can on the United States. And then the question becomes, even if we know that ISIS was responsible, what do we do? What do I mean, what, what do, we, do we drop a bomb on parts of, uh, you know, I mean, a nuclear device on parts of Syria? The so-called caliphate or the so-called Israeli state. Yeah, I mean, you, there, there, uh, is Islamic no, state. there is no center of power there. How do we respond? Uh, I want to talk about you personally. Uh, we did a lot of this tonight on the program, and I urge you to see it. Uh, and, and, but, and, and then we had wine with dinner. And we had wine with dinner. And this. 
Uh, but I want to, I'm going to give you five more minutes of this, and then I'll give you a chance. So think about what you want to want. We don't have cards. I'm going to call on you, uh, and, and we're going to judge you. And if the questions are no good, <laughs> the 92nd Street will never allow you to come back. Um, so better, think of really good questions for Ted. It must make you feel good. Um, as I've walked around this town with you, from our taping to uh, the restaurant and people coming over, um, they remember what you did. You were a part of what they thought was something, um, journalism at its best. It was vigorous. It was significant. Um, it must make you feel good. It does. And it makes me feel good. Uh, I mean, you're being as you always are. Very kind, very generous. But you are, you are that person today. You are the person that people can tune in. Uh, and I, you know, I, I told you when I appeared on the CBS Morning Show yesterday that essentially what I didn't tell you is that I'm usually just sitting in my underwear, but that I have breakfast. <laughs> I didn't want to visualize it anyway, so I'm glad you didn't. <laughs> that I, you know, I have my bowl of muesli with, yes, the, with the three of with, you with the three every of morning. Yeah. But that program that you have been doing, and, and Charlie is just coming up to his 25th anniversary. Of, of, yes, you. Thank you. what you have demonstrated for 25 years is that an engaged, intelligent man asking thoughtful, probing questions still provides the best kind of information that we can get on television. The tragedy is we don't have enough Charlie Roses around anymore. The tragedy is that our media has become so fragmented and, and in many respects so politicized that instead of giving the American public what it needs to hear, we're giving the American public what it wants to hear. That sounds like or a good thing. Or what tantalizes them. Huh? Or what tantalizes them. Or what tantalizes them. Yeah. But I, I appreciate that very much. And, and, uh, but I want to say this, is, and I, it, I was teeing this up. Uh, do you miss it? Do you miss having a platform? Uh, a platform? Sure. I mean, you obviously that, can go write a column and wherever you want to. Yeah, and that you can platform. Come, all you got to do is call me up and say, I got something I want to say. What do you, can I come on tonight? And you have a standing invitation. But having a place there, uh, whether it was once a week or not. No. I, look, Charlie, uh, I don't know how many programs you've done. It has to be roughly the same number. Yes, it is. <laughs> I did 6,000 nightlines uh, over the course of nearly 26 20, years. 25 to 6 years, right. There has, to be, there has to be a point in life where you say, enough already. And, but that's and, not what you did. You didn't say it's enough already, well, did I, you? You said they made it impossible. No, they didn't make it impossible. They made it, they made it awkward. They, they made it clear that what they were looking for was a little more pizzazz, a little more entertainment a little more youth-oriented material. They knew that my passion is, is foreign policy, uh, and foreign policy doesn't sell beans on television, right. then or now. Uh, and so it was time to move on. It really was. I mean, I, I, I am a very contented man, and as you say, if I want to do a little bit of television, I can still do a little bit of television. This was an interesting experience. Okay, well, you bring it back four or five times. So. No, no, no. I'm, no, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm not bringing it. No, that's, yeah, that's good. No. Put it up. Yeah, like put it like that. that. That's yeah, a good idea. <laughs> Hello? Lights out. You know. <laughs> and, and I've already said this. Not only did I say it, but people on the Senate floor uh, have said it. Uh, Harry Reid talked about it today. So, but, but you could have access. I, I think this is important to say about you and understanding you. Family is very, very important. And you have been in a family where you have, for a large part of your life, uh, until you were over 65. Been absent. Been absent. Yes. On the road as a foreign correspondent. Right. Uh, working at 11 o'clock at night. You're not home for dinner. Right. Uh, did you finally say to yourself, look, if it's gonna be difficult to do what I want to do, maybe there's something that I really ought to do. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I, don't, I, I don't want to make it sound too noble. Uh, 
All right. I think anyone who waits until he's 65. To wake up to, you know, right. to wake you up. You were a slow learner, sir. I was a very slow learner. <laughs> uh, you know, to arrive at the conclusion that his wife of then 40 some odd years yes. has been carrying the load alone for a very, very long time mm -hmm. and continues to carry much of the load to this day. Um, yeah. I mean, it wasn't out of any sense of nobility. It was out of a sense of, Love. Uh, you know, well, that too. But to all things, there is a, there is a season. Yeah. Yes. All right, open the lights here. We'll get some questions in from a variety of people. Can you open the lights? Can you raise the lights? Can you? That's better. Mr. Kaplan, we don't have a question from you. Uh, anybody, raise your hand. We'll take it. Start right here. Yes, sir. If you don't have a microphone, just speak up. So Stuxnet is the most sophisticated military right. Yes. What are your thoughts on it? Okay. Let me just repeat the question. Stuxnet was a was a device that they used uh, to cause great harm with the software of the Iranian enrichment machines. Uh, people think it was sort of Israel and the United States cooperating on it. Uh, he's asked, "Who do you think was behind it, and how did they do it?" Well, so. uh, it's not just people think. Yeah, it right. is. It is well known that the United States, NSA, and Israel's counterpart to NSA collaborated on launching, and you raise a very important point, because as we did with nuclear weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the United States was the first country, together with Israel, to use cyber weaponry against another nation. And what they did is they changed the centrifuges at Natanz, at the, at the uh, processing plant at Natanz in Iran. It was an extraordinary program. I mean, an extraordinary attack. They got the centrifuges spinning at the wrong speed. Right. So that it screwed up the entire nuclear program of the Iranians probably setting it back for a couple of years. And here is the stroke of genius. And, and my old friend um, from the New York Times, David Sanger, right. wrote this story in his book and in the Times. They not only screwed up the revolutions of the centrifuges, but we screwed up. What we did is we videotaped the proper running of those centrifuges and somehow managed to arrange that the people in Natanz, in the control room, were seeing not a live shot of what was happening with the centrifuges, but a video of those centrifuges operating appropriately. And meanwhile, they were spinning themselves into oblivion. Sounds like Mission Impossible. Exactly. It was brilliant. It was, within limits, successful. It was also opening the Pandora's box of cyber warfare. What we did to them, the Iranians then responded about a year later by hitting Aramco in Saudi Arabia, the big American Saudi oil company. And as, as one uh, military intelligence guy told me, what they did is they turned 30,000 computers at Aramco into bricks that was simply showing a video of a burning American flag. And, and that's connected to this because it shows you what a computer can do. The other thing that Ted has talked about is with respect to the internet and respect to computers, I mean, they have become a tool, social media has become a tool of recruitment for ISIS like nobody's ever used it before. True. Right. True. Another question, yes, right here. I'm gonna see you as many as I can get, but it's right here. Stand up, please. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. We want to hear you, sir. It's not that we want to embarrass you. I'm interested in knowing what the average American can actually do to prevent a cyber attack. Yeah. Like someone without much political power. Nothing. No. You, uh, look, you cannot prevent a, a cyber attack. There are... Uh, the fact of the matter is that Sony Pictures, for example, uh, the Wall Street Journal did a long investigative report and discovered that Sony Pictures had, I think the number was 43 firewalls in place to prevent exactly the kind of thing that ended up happening. 
one of those firewalls had not been properly attended, with the end result that I draw an analogy between the danger of cyber attacks and what happens, I mean, there's a reason why we use terms that are taken from medicine. What happens when a program is infected? What is it infected with? A virus. Why do we draw these kinds of medical analogies? Because just as in the case of Ebola, where uh, a man came back from Africa, uh, was ultimately admitted to a hospital in Texas, treated by two nurses who were wearing not one but two gowns, not one but two pairs of gloves, uh, a, a plastic shield, goggles, but they had a tiny spot on their neck that was exposed. And the patient at that point was in the throes of, of the worst effects of Ebola, uh, projectile vomiting and diarrhea, and apparently a spot landed on each of their necks, and they both got Ebola. Fortunately, each recovered. Uh, I draw that analogy to make the point that a cyber attack only requires a tiny attack surface. It doesn't require that you have access to the whole program, just some way you get in. And part of the problem is all of these things are run by human beings and human beings will take their thumb drives back from work where everything is well protected and then they plug the thumb drive into their computer at home and then they bring it back into work and the next day they have brought an infected thumb drive back which makes its way into the entire process. Again, I have to say, the internet was never designed to be defended and that's the real problem and the notion that we are sort of contentedly going through life, nodding our heads every day as we read the newspaper or hear the radio or television reports. There are thousands of successful cyber attacks every day. There are cyber attacks against our government. There are cyber attacks against our industry. There are cyber attacks against our various businesses. There are cyber attacks against the personal email accounts of our, of our director of central intelligence. Right. It would be totally naive to assume that the one area that is going to be immune to cyber attack is our infrastructure especially when you start to know something about the nature of our power industry. With is. respect, Mr. Koppel, I need to move on. Yes, you do. <laughs> uh, somebody else out there in the back, and then we'll come here and here. Okay? Right, yes, sir, right there at the back with a white, yes. A question for Ted and then for Charles. Um, how grave is the global warming crisis? How might it be affecting some of these other terrible problems that you're talking about, now, well, I mean, it's interesting that you raise that. My old friend and colleague, Barry Dunsmore, who is now living up in Vermont, writes a blog uh, and, and has been in the forefront of those pointing out that the disaster that evolved in Syria came about because there was a terrible drought in Syria, a drought that lasted for more than four years. And the farmers who were desperate came to Damascus to protest because they weren't getting any government assistance. And those protests ultimately evolved into demonstrations that became violent and a response that became even more violent and led ultimately to the civil war that we have in mm. Damascus today. I make that point only to, to draw your attention to the fact that yes, global warming has the capacity to lead into shooting wars. Yeah, I, I mean, you, just even today, I think there was a New York Times picture showing uh, what global what climate, had, you know, the change, global warming and climate change had done. Uh, I mean, if the science is overwhelming, you know, what's not overwhelming is the political will to do what is necessary. Uh, and, and I don't think most reasonable people doubt that. Uh, yes, sir. Here, and then the lady, and then you, and then Rick. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
I, li I like Charlie Rose so much that I'm hard pressed to think of anyone else that I like more. <laughs> uh, and if you think I'm going to be dumb enough to tell you yeah. whom I don't like on television uh, yeah. or, or in... But let, let me tell you one thing he has said. He has said, uh, and got a lot of a play, Brian Williams has paid enough so far. I think he has. Um, I read uh, three newspapers every morning. I'm an avid listener to NPR. Uh, my wife and I usually watch a piece of BBC uh, news in the evening and then switch over and watch uh, CBS and NBC. We kind of zip through if, if the pieces are repetitive, which they almost always are. Um, and, and, you know, that's about it. Do I spend a lot of time online checking blogs? No, you're looking at an old fogey. I do not. Well, uh, yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi. You're, you're exactly right, and you, you've sort of, uh, you've summarized far more elegantly than I did chapter two of my book. Um, and, and one of the, I think it's chapter two, it may not. Um, one, of the, one of the points I make in the book is that it is, it is hard to convince the American public of anything. We live in an age where a, a survey that was done just a couple of years ago of several thousand Americans found that when asked the question, are you certain that Barack Obama was born outside the United States? 39% said yes. When you look at similar surveys- One of them may have been Donald Trump. <laughs> when you look at similar surveys that have been done about global warming, it, it follows party lines almost exactly so that somewhere in the neighborhood of 90% of Democrats polled believe in global warming. Mm -hmm. And when the same questions are put to, to uh, Republicans, the number is somewhere around 27%. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, you know, again, there used to be a time when, when Charlie and I were young and full of vigor when Speak for yourself. America, <laughs> when Americans would gather around the flickering hearth every evening at 6.30, 7 o'clock, when, believe it or not, the most trusted man in America was a television network anchor, hmm. Walter Cronkite. But people would watch the news in the evening, and they'd watch Cronkite, and they'd watch Huntley Brinkley, and they'd watch Eric Severide, and they'd watch Howard K. Smith. Yeah. And there was a sense that these were genuine, committed professionals who were doing their level best to give people a, a, a sense, at least, of what the most important issues in the world were. We're way past that now. Yeah. Uh, Rick Kaplan, former executive producer of Nightland. But you're a very fast reader, yeah. you know that. <laughs> well, I was so fascinated by this that I didn't have time. If, if we were doing a night on this, we'd probably lead with, I think, a piece that would cover what I'm about to ask you. When you say there's a cyber attack and it's on our power grid, what, are, are we talking about computers that cause our circuit breakers to overload? I mean, what is it really that happens to our power grid that makes it so impossible uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a somewhat complex answer to a perfectly legitimate question, but um, as many of you probably know, our power system is such that there has to be perfect equilibrium between the production of electricity and the consumption of electricity. I analogize it, and it's an over simply, I mean, it's an overly simple analogy. Imagine, pardon me, imagine a balloon that has a thousand valves and you are pumping air in through some of the valves and taking air out through others of the valves. To the degree that you pump too much air in, the balloon will burst. To the degree that you take too much air out, the balloon will collapse. 
The same thing is true of our power grid. There is a system, it's called the SCADA system, the Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition System, that keeps the, the production and the delivery of electricity in perfect balance. If someone can get into that SCADA system and throw it out of balance, all or part of the system will collapse. That's an oversimplification, but that's, that's how you would attack it. Because there would be a cascading effect, Rick. I mean, what would happen is, uh, you remember just a few years ago, we had a power outage when some tree limbs brushed against some of these high power cables. And the power was out across the Northeast for a period of about three or four days. At the time, only seven people died. Only $3 billion in associated costs were involved. Um, that's a, a simple example of how difficult it can be to get online. There was, there was an attack out not too far from San Francisco uh, a few years back on the Metcalf substation, a power station, in which a, apparently a group of people brought AK-47s to the scene and shot out 17 high power transformers, knocking the power out in Silicon Valley. They were able to reroute it, but the guy who was then in charge of the federal agency that theoretically controls the power industry um, said at the time, if someone were to do this and hit, I think it was nine of just the right transmission stations at the same time, you could knock out power throughout the United States. It doesn't have to be a cyber attack. I mean, this can be done with military weapons, I mean, with guns. And bombs. Yeah. Uh, let me finally read this. This is the opening of, of chapter one. Darkness, extended periods of darkness, longer and more profound than anyone now living in one of America's great cities has ever known. As power shuts down, there's darkness and the sudden loss of electrical conveniences. As batteries lose power, there is the more gradual failure of cell phones, portable radios, and flashlights. Emergency generators provide pockets of light and power, but there is little running water anywhere. In cities with water towers on the roofs of high-rise buildings, gravity keeps the flow going for two, perhaps three days. When this runs out, taps go dry. Toilets no longer flush. Emergency supplies of bottled water are too scarce to use for anything but drinking, and there is nowhere to replenish supply. Disposal of human waste becomes a critical issue within days. That's the danger Lights Out is about. Thank you, Ted Koppel. Thank you. Uh,